Welcome to the Glencliff United Methodist Church Sermon Podcast, where we come together as a community to explore and deepen our faith. I'm delighted to have you join us today from Nashville, Tennessee, a city known for its rich musical heritage and vibrant spirit. Whether you're a longtime member of our congregation, a visitor seeking spiritual nourishment, or someone who stumbled upon this podcast by chance, we extend a warm welcome to you. Here at Glencliff United Methodist Church, we strive to create a space that is inclusive, compassionate, justice-seeking, and rooted in the love of Christ. We believe that faith is a journey, and we're honored to walk alongside each other, offering support and encouragement along the way. Our sermons are crafted with the intention of inspiring, challenging, and illuminating the timeless wisdom found in sacred texts. In this ever-changing world, we find solace and strength in gathering as a community, even in virtual spaces. As we embark on this sacred time together, let us open our hearts and minds, ready to receive the transformative power of God's wisdom. Our sermon from September 3rd, 2023 was delivered by me, Rev. Ryan Dunn. This sermon speaks to the challenges of living peaceably in a polarized culture. Drawing from Romans 12, we reflect on the importance of genuine love, mutual affection, and showing honor. Listen for what we can do when disagreements arise, and ultimately how the example of Christ leads us towards a harmonious existence. Now, let's enter into a time of reflection and worship as we dive into this sermon. Is this mic on? Okay, I'm in charge of that, so if it's not, it's a problem. But my name is Ryan. Um, I am one of the volunteer clergy people hanging around Glencliff. We actually have quite a few of those. So those of us that uh, hold day jobs in other places, for some reason, Glencliff has this attraction to those of us who want to like volunteer in ministry. And I prefer to kind of hide in the back most of the time, but sometimes they're like, you got to get out of the box and come and say a few things. So um, holiday weekends and uh, place, times when other people are on vacation, such is my time. So I'm here to shine this morning. Let's go. Our scripture reading this morning is out of Romans. It's chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. And it goes like this. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord for us, the people of God. You know, we pull a lot of these verses out of something called the lectionary. It's kind of like this prescription for verses that you can preach on on any given Sunday morning. A lot of churches adopt this, and so there's this cool kind of unification across our Christian world where a lot of churches are looking at the lectionary and preaching on on Romans 12 this morning. So you get a sense that like these are prescribed texts you're supposed to go with, and sometimes you read these verses and you're like, I don't know what else I got to say. Like, this is pretty good. Like Paul wrote it down, kind of nailed it, it's pretty explicit, right? Outdo one another in showing honor, persevere in prayer, live, live peaceably with all, overcome evil with good. Like, I don't have to dive into the context of who Paul was writing to or anything for us to pull some kind of meeting out for today. It's there. 
Um, I often bristle when I hear the, the phrase, the Bible said it, I believe it, that settles it. Uh, it's never quite that simple, but in this case, I don't know, I might stretch to say like, okay, maybe it is. So when I got this text and I sat down to actually like jot down some thoughts, um, I found that there just wasn't a whole lot there. So I did what a lot of us would probably do. I squirted over to another website. In my case, that was Twitter or X, sorry. And you know what I found on Twitter or X? I found that, guess what? There are people who are struggling to live peaceably with one another. And it's not exclusive to Twitter. I want to lay that out there. But, but boy, oh boy, does Twitter really give you like a snapshot of people struggling to live peaceably with one another? There's a whole cross section of it there. So some of the, red, some of the comments that I came across, you, sir, are an idiot. I wanted to make sure I wasn't making eye contact with anybody when I read that. Um, I can't wait to see them locked up for good. This is just more woke garbage. This is a terrible take on a complicated issue. Do better. You get the idea. I'm not going to go on with this stuff. But these are people of faith supposedly commenting to other people of faith. Um, so, yeah, it's a little disheartening. People are struggling to live peaceably with one another. I also found that I was invited to follow an account that encourages people to, to leave the United Methodist Church. That's actually what it's called, leave the UMC. And in reading that as a clergy member of the United Methodist Church, I got, um, I got lost in some thoughts of wishing ill will for that account. Not that they should be struck down or anything, no smiting, but just that, that nobody would follow that account, that they might be failing in their mission that they proclaim. So we thankfully here at Glencliff have kind of made this big issue around this Twitter account a non-issue for us. So we don't talk about a whole lot, the at-large issues with the United Methodist denomination. And Ingrid and Nicole are probably wishing that I would shut up about this, but bear with me for a second because I think that this really kind of gives us a snapshot to look at this whole piece of scripture in general and how it's being played out today. So um, it puts some real flesh on maybe how we can outdo one another in showing honor and even blessing those who persecute, uh, etc. So the big context here is that the United Methodist Church is splintering. A new denomination has formed. They've taken a number of former United Methodist churches with them. So this Leave the UMC X account is inviting people to move to this new expression. And the big overview of the nature of the shift is that, um, or the split, is that we have different theologies. Right? Glencliff, we express a theology of openness and equity. It's bound by justice, and that really falls in line with a lot of the current UMC thinking. Uh, the new denomination differs just on how we interpret those points. So I have a friend from an old area of ministry, a place where I used to live, and this friend has disaffiliated. So we both knew years ago that we really saw differently on a lot of theological points, but it didn't change the, the reality that we still felt trust for one another. We still really wanted to work with one another. And I lament those times, especially now, because I feel like we've moved into this kind of all or nothing time in our culture. Like this is a time when we're either all in agreement or we're gonna completely disassociate from one another. And this isn't just in church, this is really in our culture at large. It's across all these areas of lives. I'll bet that each one of us can think about a relationship in our life that has kind of shut down or been a victim of this polarized time that we're, we're living into. Anyways, my friend's church voted not to disaffiliate. They wanted to stay. So, so this friend left and became part of a new church start. And this is a friend I want to root for. If the circumstances were different, I would probably say, hey, I'm, I'm with you 100%. But in this situation, this one where I feel like we're diverging onto almost these competitive paths, I need to admit that it's difficult to root for them, yes. friend or not. It's difficult not to wish some form of failure. Yes. It's difficult to try to, to outdo the other in showing honor. 
It's difficult to seek to live peaceably because, honestly, the preference here is really not to be in relationship with the other at all. It would be so much easier if we just really didn't have anything to do with each other. And, and maybe that is a form of living peaceful, peaceably to completely disconnect or disassociate from our adversaries. But really in the world of practical ministry, in the world of um, well, seeking to be people of love and live in community with each other, I have a feeling that it's not really realistic. Like we can't just dis disassociate from everybody. At some point, we're going to have to interact with those who have detracted from us. And I get the sense in Paul's letter here, these verses from Romans 12, that he didn't really advocate completely disassociating from the other either. So the situation really in our state capital this, these past few weeks, it kind of underscores the need for us to not simply divide and disassociate. Because we find that, well, as people in power have sought to remove and silence those who disagree with them, it separates people. It draws a a perpetual divide in an estrangement in the people of our community. There's a growing distance. So right now, where we are in our church, maybe in our society at large too, is in the rejoicing in hope, patient in suffering, and persevering in prayer portion of Paul's prescription for peace. Jesus talked about showing honor to our adversaries as well. And his recommendations, I believe, are really what spurred Paul to write what Paul wrote, and recommending and feeding hungry enemies, and thereby heap burning coals on their heads, which I think reveals some of Paul's humanity. Because even while he's telling the congregation to take the high road, well, he's still imagining that their adversaries just might get their supposed comeuppance too. Anyways, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus famously provides recommendations for reacting to those who do wrong by us. And I'll skip the turn the other cheek part. We've heard that. You know it. But after that, he said, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. I've heard that these recommendations were really both socially and politically subversive. Supposedly, Roman soldiers at that time could compel citizens to carry equipment for one mile, but if they kind of leaned into that privilege a little bit too much, then they were considered weak and lazy. So if you're taking the path two miles, you're exposing the weakness of the soldier. And giving over one's clothes would reveal the greed of the plaintiff or the sewer more than it reveals the vulnerability of the defendant. In all cases, it seems that the response of the faithful is not to seek retribution. If we're to live peaceably with one another, it means putting an end to cycles in which we perpetually become impediments of the other's well-being. So I'll admit that I'm not a big fan of my friend's church startup. I'm not going to seek to impede its success. In seminary, they teach would-be preachers to highlight the good news of every scriptural selection. And I don't feel like I've gotten to that part of this, this piece of scripture yet. We're not to the good news. And in part, it's because in our whole way of being right now, our society at large, I don't feel like we've lived in to the good news yet. And I feel like before we hit the good news that there might just be a, a little bit more harrowing news. There's an old adage that says that friends are forged in tears. And again, most of us can recount the events of our lives, and we can pinpoint an instance in which we saw that lived out, in which the hardships of our lives served as some kind of catalyst for bringing us closer with others. Paul said, weep with those who weep. And this is a jagged little pill, but it's, it's one full of all kinds of hope, actually. It's a hope that suggests that the discord that we currently sit in, this uneasiness, it might be drawing us closer in the bonds of friendship and community. Rejoice in hope, Paul said. There's a call for patience in the midst of these verses, and there's a reminder that in that, that all things sit in God's hands. And we can take hope 
that God's nature is love and justice. We don't read in these verses a call to acquiesce to injustice, but instead to overcome it with love. As United Methodists, we have this kind of peculiar, peculiar theology that we are on a road of perfection in love, that somehow someday we ourselves will become perfect in love as God is perfect in love. And I believe that one of the marks of that perfected love will be evident when we greet injustice and discord and, and evil with love instead of retribution. Just this past week, I learned that um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s public social justice ministry kind of started as a bit of a, a trick. It seems that some church leaders around Montgomery conspired to give the job of organizing the, the Rosa Parks, in Rosa Parks initiated, I suppose, bus boycott to the new guy on the scene. So it was kind of like he missed the meeting and they were like, guess what? You're leading this thing now. Now, certainly it was probably a lot more than that. There was a spirit at work there, but, um, but Martin Luther King found himself in leadership of this movement. And one month after being thrust into this position of leadership, Reverend King's home was firebombed while he was away at a meeting. And his wife and seven-month-old daughter were at home. And so he rushed home, found a, a large crowd gathered outside, some of them carrying weapons and prepared to take action, and police were on hand as well. White police were on hand as well, which probably made this situation feel, well, that much more tense, yeah. So Dr. King confirmed that his family was fine, and then stood on his burned out porch and addressed the crowd. And he urged them at that moment towards nonviolence. He said, if you have weapons, take them home. If you don't have them, please do not seek them. We cannot solve this problem through violence. We must meet violence with nonviolence. He went on to say, I want you to love your enemies. Be good to them, love them, and let them know you love them. The crowd dispersed not long after that. Uh, Dr. King reassured him with these words, saying, go home and don't worry. We're not hurt. And remember, if anything happens to me, there will be others to take my place. And this was not an acquiescence. It was, it was strength. It was bound in an assurance that love is, in fact, the answer. The more perfect way is love, as Paul would have put it. The Old Testament prophets often spoke of their communities being perfected in love. I think that was kind of the goal of what many of them were talking about and what it would look like. Uh, Habakkuk was one such prophet. If you came this morning hoping to get your dose of Habakkuk, you are in luck. He was also, though, one who dared to complain about the circumstances around him. So uh, see if you can't find your voice in this set of of readings as well. He says, I will stand on my watch posts and station myself on the rampart. I'll keep watch to see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that the runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. So we'll wait for it as it tarries. I love that word. In the meantime, we hope that as we mourn, we're drawn together. As we meet discord, we learn to extend peace. As we encounter disharmony, we learn to move towards a, a perfected love. <laughs> And I suppose that's the good news, that even as discord rules our Twitter feeds and other places, the loving hands of God propel us forward with a sense of perfecting love. We're getting there. It will surely come. It will not delay. And it won't delay because of this truth. We all share in the same longings. The longing for communion. This longing for togetherness, for safety, for Compassion experienced and compassion extended. We all share in a longing for love. And it's God's great longing 
that we might encounter that as well. That this creation which established itself so long ago in communion and equity and equality and which was called good, that it can be realized once again. So thanks for your time today. Um, let's move forward in prayer before we sing again. God, we wait. We wait in anticipation of, of what you've promised. We wait with the idea that we have a role to be active in. May we see the ways this week in which we can extend love, in which we can both encounter compassion and offer compassion, in which we can bless and seek to show honor. God, we give you thanks for the perfect example that you provided in your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for this thought-provoking and hopefully uplifting sermon from Glencliff United Methodist Church. We hope that the message has resonated with you, inspiring you to live out your faith in meaningful ways. Remember, our journey of faith doesn't end here. As we go forth from this moment, let us carry the light of God's love within us, shining brightly in our relationships, our communities, and the world around us. May we be agents of healing, justice, and reconciliation guided by the teachings of Jesus. We invite you to connect with us further and explore the many opportunities for growth, fellowship, and service that our church offers. If you found today's sermon meaningful, share it with a friend or loved one who may benefit from these words of encouragement. If you'd like to support Glencliff United Methodist Church financially, visit glencliffumc.org slash donate. Until we meet again, remember that you are cherished and your presence in this world matters. God loves you. There's nothing you can do about that. You can simply choose how you'll respond to that love. Amen.